السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا قيما لينذر بأسا شديدا من لدنه ويبشر المؤمنين الذين يعملون الصالحات أن لهم أجرا حسنا ماكثين فيه أبدا رب الشحن صدري ويسر لي أمري وحب العقدة بالجسان يفقه قولي الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين ثم ما بعد ونسجان السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Start by saying that I'm extremely happy and uh, very excited to be here Alhamdulillah it's always been good to see new faces and be new Muslims, alhamdulillah, and visit another house of Allah Azza wa Jal. I make a lot of dua as myself and some of my students are traveling with me. We make lots of dua that uh, Allah Azza wa Jal bless this masjid with unity, with more and more successful programs, that you have something to offer for the women of this community, the children of this community, the youth of this community, the elders of this community, and that Allah Azza wa Jal bring, this, uh, bring the light of Islam to the greater area in this region through the house of Allah Azza wa Jal. Notice I didn't raise any funds, okay. So, <laughs> now uh, what I wanted to use uh, this opportunity for is to talk to you about a surah that I've been meaning to talk about for some time and, uh, you know, share some, some lessons with you from the beginning of Surah Al-Kahab and some insights that some great scholars of the past have had on this remarkable surah. Obviously, this is a good occasion to talk about Surah Al-Kahab. Also, you want me to lift the mic? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, a lot of scholars have talked about the surah and it's particularly relevant to talk about the surah on Friday. Anyone know why? Why specifically Friday is a good day to talk about the surah? <laughs> it's masnoon. It's, you know, it's part of the sunnah of the Prophet Islam, and part of his recommendations that before the Friday prayer that we recite, so we've got part of it, all of it, there are different hadith, different narrations. But regardless, we know it's part of our tradition. And of those various instructions and advice and teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, is the idea that this surah will somehow protect us, or it has to do with protecting us, from the fitna that is coming, that will be the greatest trial, the greatest difficulty to befall mankind, the fitna and the jad. So it has something to do with protecting us from future troubles, future difficulties. When you study those ahadith, and I'm no muhadith, so I can't speak on behalf of those ahadith with any authority, but as an overview, when you study those ahadith, you do learn of some great trial, great war, great trouble that is coming the way of humanity, and great clash that will happen between the forces of good and the forces of evil before the world itself comes to an end and the entire saga of humanity is finished. This surah, and that, if those are the greatest wars to ever fall against humanity and the greatest troubles that will ever come, ever come against humanity, this surah offers somehow protection and counsel and somehow prepares us to deal with some of those greatest troubles. And the idea is if it can prepare us for those greatest troubles, then it can help us deal with the troubles we're facing now too, before that time also. Now, Allah Azza wa in this surah, in the very beginning, gives us a really interesting warning. After describing the greatness of the Qur'an, which we'll talk about in a second, Allah Azza wa gives us one of the reasons for which this book was sent. وَيُنْذِرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدًا To warn those that say Allah has taken a son. It's very interesting as a chronology in the Qur'an that Surah Al-Isra, also called Surah Bani Israel, is the surah right before this one. And in the previous surah, Allah talks at some length about Jewish history. The history of the previous nation that was Muslim. And from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, we learn that this surah has something to do with the future of these Muslims. In other words, the past of the former Muslims and then the future of the current Muslims. It's like a timeline that's been created. It's a timeline that's been created in these two surahs together. Now, in this surah specifically, Allah didn't highlight in the beginning the Jews, but rather the Christians. He says, One of the functions of this book is to warn those 
will say Allah has taken a son. Obviously the Christian. They have no knowledge of what they say. And they, they don't possess knowledge, they have nothing of it, nor their ancestors who made such claims. How huge, how enormous the words are that are coming out of their mouths. They're saying nothing but Allah. But here's the word, here are the words that I really want to highlight before you. The central ayah I want to talk to you about today is this ayah. Allah tells His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is it, that, is it a possibility then that you will worry so much about them? You're going to destroy yourself thinking so much about what? Over the consequences their consequences. Athar, literally an af is a footstep left behind in the sand. That's an af. Athar is the consequences. Somebody's been through here, these are the traces that are left behind. These are athar. Another word, another uh, 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 meaning of the word athar is ruins. Like we say, uh, you know, al-athar al-Rumaniya, al-athar al-Misriya, Egyptian ruins, Roman ruins, buildings left behind, traces of what, what came before. Allah Azza wa Jalla is highlighting that there's something about the Christian faith, something about it in the future of the world, it will have some very deep and scarring consequences. And the Prophet is so worried about those consequences that Allah says, You worried so much, you'll almost kill yourself out of grief, out of worry. If they don't come to believe in this perfect speech, this Quran, out of grief, so بَاقِعُ النَّفْسَكْ أَسَفًا Out of grief, out of stress, out of sadness, that you, you, you'll end up dying. That's how worried you are. What is the Prophet ﷺ so worried about? Some of our scholars in recent times, as late as the late 1800s, tried to explore this idea, what about Christian creed? What about the effects of Christianity on the world? Is, that, is, is it that the Prophet ﷺ is so worried about? And how is it related to the end of times? I want to take you on a short journey. You all, I mean, many of you are, are, are some, I see some young faces here, you're in high school, a lot of you are done high school, a lot of you are, mashallah, way beyond high school. But you've studied something of American history. You've also studied something of European history. You're familiar with the idea of the French Revolution, yes? The European Enlightenment, you're familiar with those concepts. And you're familiar with the idea that the, essentially the revolution was against one major institution. What was that institution? Anybody know? What was the revolution against? The institution of the church. The institution of the church. I mean, the idea of the revolution is, is there are many steps in it, but essentially the church was arguing and preaching to the people that the world, the earth, is at the center of the universe, and that the earth is flat. And it had all kinds of unscientific ideas. And when scientists in Europe started to disagree with these ideas, their books were being burned. Libraries were being torn down. People were being put to death for having ideas that contradicted the Bible. And more and more people realize this religion and what it has to force on us doesn't make any common sense, we have to fight against it. And so there's this revolution that happens against the church. Even though Christianity survived, Christianity lives even beyond the effects of that revolution. Obviously we're still living in a, in a world, in a Western world that is predominantly Christian. But the original revolution was actually against fundamental Christian creed. Essentially, that was replaced. Those ideas, the world is flat, the earth, the human being is special, he's at the center of the universe, etc., etc., those ideas were all replaced. They were replaced with something else. They were essentially replaced with a scientific worldview. And in the scientific worldview, everything that Christianity had to say about the world had to have been wrong. In other words, the, the world is not flat. We're not at the center of the universe. And if, the, if Christianity argued that the human beings are the most special creature in the world, we're the special creature chosen by God, etc., etc., well, that idea must be dumb also. We're just any other creation. We're just like any other animal. We're just more evolved than they are. That's all we are. This idea started taking hold. The scientific mind started arguing and wrestling with the religious mind. So even those that are religious, when they go into higher studies, they say, you know what? When it comes to evolution, when it comes to higher philosophy or science, I leave my religion out of it. I don't like to think about it. Because I know there's too much of a contradiction. I just can't handle it. So I'll just, I'll stay religious if I can on Sunday. 
if I can. But other than that, I have to move on with my life and think about things you know, in the real world through what is the real study of the world, science, technology, research, etc. Et As a result, something else happened. This idea of science replacing Christianity slowly started becoming science replacing religion altogether. In Europe, there was already an idea that they are the, the supreme civilization. All other civilizations are somehow beneath them. To this day, actually, and originally, you know how we call them Orientalists? Orientalists are people that study the Orient, meaning the East. But the original inquiry into the East was very similar to maybe some of you have seen Discovery Channel documentaries where they study animals. <coughs> and they have the camera on the line and say, look how interesting, the lion's waiting for his prey. He's about to attack. And he's off. What a remarkable study. And they're studying these animals and they're saying, what a remarkable study. Well, they studied Chinese civilization. They studied Hindu civilization. They studied you know, Muslim civilization. They say, what a remarkable religion. They chant their Quran. You know. With this underlying assumption that somehow they are the superior religion and they're studying these inferior cultures that are so interesting. We find them we find their artifacts and their art so interesting. I was talking to a professor like that, I was talking to him about Islam, all he kept bringing up to me was your architecture, is really remarkable, you know. The tapestry in New York, I'm not talking about your architecture. I'm talking about the architecture of the human being, <laughs> not of our buildings. But the, you know, this lens by which looking down at all the religions. Because religions in and of themselves, they're false, that's already been proven. So since Christianity has been disproven, that must mean all religions have no doubt. They're all out the window. And all the arguments for faith that Christianity has to produce, well, how can any other faith have any other kinds of arguments? This was obviously the number one religion. So if this one lost, everybody else lost by default. They don't even have to be entered into the contest. You understand? This mentality, as a, as a result of it, there are several consequences. We're talking about the consequences of Christian civilization. Allah says, will you kill yourself in grief over their consequences? We're seeing more consequences of Christian creed in the world today than ever before. Than ever before. As a result of that war against an irrational faith, a war against all faiths began. And it didn't have to be a war of weapons. It was a war of ideas. It was a war of education systems. How many people here got an education in India, Pakistan, for example? A little bit of an education. Okay. Me too. I'm a father. Proud father. Okay. If you don't know what fob is, then you're probably not one. So, okay. <laughs> but anyway, let me tell you something about that. <coughs> so we're in, high, we're in eighth grade in Pakistan, and we study matter can neither be created nor destroyed. We're still learning in the 90s, we're still, we're still learning Newtonian physics. In, your, in my exam, on the paper, I had, literally had to write, matter can neither be created nor destroyed, and if I don't write that, I'll get points off. That statement in and of itself is against what we believe as Muslims. The only one who is not created, and the only one who cannot be destroyed is who? Allah. And yet Muslims, in a Muslim country, sitting in a Muslim school, and after that they're going to recite Qur'an, are writing on a paper, matter can neither be created nor destroyed. And if they don't agree with that, they will fail their exam. Isn't that crazy? It's like science is somewhere else, and religion is somewhere else. And the two don't, and I, I know we're in Einstonian times now, we're not in Newtonian <coughs> physics anymore. We don't believe that anymore, but that's how backward some of our countries are, right? We're still teaching Newtonian physics in this era, subhanAllah. But they're right, and we're, you know, and we're documenting it, and we're accepting these ideas. But it has spiritual consequences, and let me tell you what they are. In a religious world, in a religious world, you have two concerns. Your primary concern is saving your soul. Concern is serving God. Even if you don't have Islam as a religion, whatever your religion is, your focus is God, your focus is worship, your focus is your soul. When God is removed from the picture, your soul is removed, there is no soul. What, can you scientifically prove there's a soul inside us? No. There is no EKG scan. There is no monitor that you have in the hospital that can check whether you have a soul or not. So let's not worry about the things we can't see. The entire point of the scientific revolution is, let's study and explore and focus on things we can see. If we can't see it, don't worry about it. Whether it's there or not, who cares? So let's, okay, God, no God, who cares? I'm an agnostic. I don't care. 
That's not the point. What is, what is there right now in front of me is the human body, the physical universe, science, technology, finance, etc., etc., etc. That's what we should worry about. So the focus of the human being shifted from serving God in the unseen, from being amazed by God. You know what they are now? They're amazed by the universe. I'll see, I've seen recently, I've seen some documentaries too about the universe. And of course, we're supposed to, as Muslims, appreciate the universe. And we're supposed to study the universe and explore it because the more we appreciate how great the universe is, it makes us realize how great Allah's creation is. But I was listening to this documentary and this physicist is talking about the creation and the constantly expanding universe and how tiny the earth is compared to the constantly expanding universe. And constantly, he's, it's almost as though he's praising the universe itself. It's such an amazing thing. It's so incredible, this universe. I love studying it. I'm fascinated by it. Nature is such a powerful force, etc., etc., etc. Where is he not? He can't go one step further. The last thing he can appreciate, the thing he will appreciate more than anything else is what? The universe itself. What, what step is he not willing to take? Allah. Who put this universe in? He can't take that step. They will study everything. They'll study the human body. They'll study the human body. They'll study health. And they'll come to appreciate the intricacies of the human being, but not appreciate the one who designed it, the one who put it in place. And so the focus of humanity, not just some people, humanity, regardless of your religion, the focus became the things we can see. The focus became your, your job, your promotion, your money, your physical health, your worldly things. And if religion does have a place, it has a place maybe once a week. Maybe once a week we can make some time, so the, the, the Hindu might show up at his temple, the Christian might show up at his church, the Jew might, Jew might show up at the synagogue, the Muslim might show up at the masjid, but that's just once a week if you have time, and usually what, you should, what should you try to do? Try to leave as late as possible, so you catch as little of that annoying khutbah as you can, and park outside the parking lot, because you don't want to get stuck anywhere, you don't want to spend too much time in the masjid, you might get infected. So just spend as little time as you can in the masjid. Come in, basically barely catch the second rak'ah, that's what the majority of Muslims do. Barely catch the second rak'ah, and then get out of here, immediately. That's okay, that's what we had to give to religion. Now we can focus on why we are really on this earth, to get our promotion, to expand our business, to go for it. You understand? And then the even crazier thing happened. Christianity felt like it was an orphan. I told you originally the war was against, Science and what? Christianity. Then it eventually it expanded to all of us. But Christianity felt like, hey, what about us? You left us behind? We can't just, you can't just leave us behind, the Christian faith behind. So Christianity started trying to keep itself relevant. How did it keep itself relevant? It started pushing the idea, hey look, the Bible has a lot of science in it. The Bible has a lot of scientific facts in it. You know, and therefore the Bible is as good as Science, because science is the top dog now. So if you want to be relevant, you have to be at least close to the, at least we agree with science. So let's show the scientific phenomena in the, in the Bible so that people will say, okay, okay, okay. It doesn't make, it's not entirely irrational, at least some of it makes sense, so we can accept it a little. We can have these proofs. In the mind of the person who's evaluating, who's comparing the Bible and science, and they're looking at scientific measures, you know what they've already accepted? They've already accepted science is superior to revelation. Revelation has to come and compete with science, and if it agrees, then we'll take it. If it doesn't agree, then who needs revelation? And guess what happened later on in recent <coughs> history? Most, and I'm not saying we shouldn't study science in the Quran. Please mark my words carefully. I'm saying we should study it. But the attitude has to be right. If we're exploring science in the Quran for the purpose of, hey, look guys, there's science in the Quran. That must mean we're a legitimate religion. The Islam has been a legitimate religion with clear proofs before any scientific development that we see today. Before any of it. The proofs have always been there. They're not new proofs. They may further help us, fine. But this is not the reason for which Islam all of a sudden, now we know for sure, yes, Islam is the truth because it has certain scientific embryological facts, or it has certain geological facts, etc., etc. That's not, it's not the correct way of thinking. But this mentality shows you something, that even many Muslims have in the back of their minds accepted the superiority of what? Science. Science. The, 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 the knowledge that human beings seek to learn. 
And they put that in a place higher than the knowledge of revelation, the knowledge that Allah Himself gives. The knowledge that Allah Himself gives. It's a strange situation. And it be, even the Muslim finds himself in that situation. So that's one, the intellectual problem. But the second is even a deeper problem. <coughs> to help you understand the second and the deeper problem, inshallah ta'ala, which is what this surah, Surah Al-Qaf is all about. It's about materialism. Let me tell you what that means in simple terms. I, for fun, and I've said this many times in my talks, I listen to a lot of Christian talk radio, and I listen to a lot of preachers. I want to know what they have to say, the different denominations. And there's one theme running across the Protestant faith and all of its variations. The Catholic faith said this world is evil. You, in order to get close to God, you have to deny yourself pleasures. So the highest, the most spiritual people, the Aimba, the Ruhban, in the Christian faith were the monks. And the higher you are spiritually, that means the more you have denied the world and its pleasures. You don't eat delicious food, you don't wear comfortable clothes. Allah Azza says they tried to deny dunya, even though it's natural for them. They weren't able to give it consideration as it deserved. They tried though. They tried to deny the world. They're not going to get married. They're going to live in a monastery. They're going to deny it because the world itself is evil. Human beings are essentially, the world and everything in it is evil. The Protestant faith comes along and says, no. You've been focusing on the next world and this world is evil. The scientific revolution tells us not to focus on the next world but on this world, this world is not evil, this world is great. And God wants us to do great in this world. So the preacher will come on Sunday and say, God wants you to get that promotion. He wants you to get that new job. He wants you to refinance your home. He wants you to get that nice car. And praise be to the Lord, when you drive your fancy car, that means the Lord loves you. That's how you know. The Lord loves you. In other words, the more dunya you have, the more worldly acquisitions you have, that must be proof that who loves you more? God's, you know, the Lord's great. Lord's helping me out. He's been, he's been so kind. You know, that's what He wants you to do. This mentality, the more dunya you have, that must be proof that Allah is really happy with you. And if you don't have a lot of dunya, it must be something wrong with you. You need to pray, bro. In other words, even if you pray, you pray for dunya. <laughs> you see that? Even something that was supposed to be focused on God, now even that became focused on dunya. Did that affect the Muslim mind, this attitude? Did it affect the Muslim mind? Did the Muslim end up only asking dua for dunya? Did that happen to us? Even when we make dua, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, wa fil aakhirati hasana, wa qina adab al All of you know this dua. And you know in this dua we ask for two things, dunya and akhirah. But you know what's going on in your head, don't you? Ya Allah, I know it says dunya and akhirah. Akhirah can wait until the akhirah. Let me just get my promotion done. Let this interview go well. Let me get married to her. Let her family say yes. Let the immigration interview go properly. Let me become a citizen. Li abuna min al khalidin. Right? <laughs> so I can be permanent resident. Right? Let me just get that. <coughs> Even though we ask in that, in, in that dua itself, we're asking for dunya and akhara, our focus in our head is still dunya. It just, it affected us. We got infected by it. I met a, some years ago, I met a brother who had a very difficult life. Subhanallah, he had a very difficult life. He was actually, uh, uh, used to work in one of the Gulf states, Muslim brother, Pakistani fellow. He used to work in the Gulf, one of the Gulf states, and his shaykh took his visa, his iqama, the passport, and he wouldn't give it back to him. And he kept him working for him for five years, he didn't pay him. Just food, food and a room, that's it. And somehow or another, he stole his passport and ran off. And got away and he moved to America. And he started, uh, you know, he took a mortgage out and, you know, got into some shady businesses and eventually ran an ice cream truck. And he was making good money running his ice cream truck and he was paying mortgage on his ice cream truck off, etc. You know, by selling it, selling ice cream in the summer. And I met him at the Masjid because he used to sell ice cream at the Sunday school. So I met him at the Masjid, he's telling me his life story because Allah has been really good to me. As soon as I applied for my mortgage, I got approved right away. And when I wanted to refinance, I got approved right away too. And I don't, most of my cash is, my, most of my income is cash. I don't have to report most of it. Because it's, it's cash. So I report like maybe $10,000 and I get government support on top of that. Allah has been very kind. <laughs> His proof that Allah is kind to him was, he gets to get away with a lot of cheating. He gets to, you know, get involved with questionable practices. 
financial transactions. He gets to get into that stuff and make a lot of money. That must mean if Allah was bad at me, I would have been bankrupt. Well, I used to be in big trouble. Now Allah has made my life good. This is proof that Allah loves me. This is the same surah that will trash that mentality. It will destroy that mindset. In this surah, we will learn the story of two gardeners. One of them is very wealthy. And he says, <laughs> I don't think this will go anywhere. <laughs> even if I was to go back to my master, <laughs> I will get even better. If Allah gave me so much in this dunya, that must mean He really likes me. He's going to hook me up in the after. Oh my God. I can only imagine. If I got a big screen TV here, oh, I can't even see it. Imagine the mentions of what he's going to give me in my entertainment system, in my paradise, you know, my mansion in paradise. That's his mentality. This mentality is poison. What we enjoy in this world, what Allah gives us in this world, when Allah allows you to buy a house, when Allah allows you to pay off the house, when Allah allows you to get a nice car, you're allowed to have all of those things. By the way, one said, only worry about dunya. The other said, dunya is evil. What does the Muslim say? What does the Muslim say? Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us what to think. وَلَقَدْ مَكَّنَّاكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَجَعَلْنَا لَكُمْ فِيهَا مَعَايِشْ قَدِيلًا مَا تَشْكُرُونَ We settled you in the earth. We gave you means of living well. How little you think. In other words, you should have good things in this world. Allah gave them to you. It's not a punishment. The world is not evil. And you should be grateful to Allah Azza wa Jalla for it. We understand that the things Allah gave us in this world, all of them, the luxuries and the difficulties, all of them are a test. It's not good and bad in and of itself. A lot of money is not necessarily good, and no money isn't necessarily bad. This, this, that's not how we think of good and bad. The wealthy person is not better than the poorer person. They're not. They're not. One is closer to, in the eyes of Allah than the other. It doesn't work that way, it's not. It doesn't work that way. Both of them are a test. It's just a different test. Some people Allah tests them with money, other people Allah tests them with, poor, with, with, with poverty. Some people Allah tests them with luxury, some other people Allah tests them with difficulty. Some people Allah tests them with health, strength. Some other people Allah tests them with sickness, weakness. They're all a test at the end. Now, this is the world in which we live. I'll tell you how these things affect us. This seems like a philosophical conversation. Let me bring it down to the level of children. Specifically children. I was in front of Sunday school kids one time in my life. It's a D Sunday school. And I brought some pictures with me. I brought some pictures with me. I brought a picture of a guy driving a really expensive like convertible car, driving up into a mansion. Then I have a picture of a homeless guy living in a cardboard box in like one alley in New York City. Right? Then I had a picture of somebody, you know, like having a lot of cash in his hand. And you have a picture of somebody holding his hand out like this. He's got a couple of pennies in his hand, somebody asking him or to take pennies. So I asked the student, you need to tell me which one of these people is successful. If I point out the pictures of the successful people and point out the pictures who are losers in life. There was no disagreement. All the kids said one. The wealthy is successful. The poor one is a loser. He doesn't have money. If he doesn't have a house, obviously he's a loser. You tell me, Fir'aun had a nice house or no? He had a nice house or no? Was he a loser or no? He was, wasn't he? Ibrahim السلام, lost his home or no? Was he kicked out of the house? So he was homeless? A winner or no? <laughs> we, don't, we don't judge by those standards. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lived in a cave. He was literally deported. He lost his citizenship. He was deported from Makkah. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, lived in a cave. Success or failure? Success. Our judgment is different. The way we think about these things is different. But the world is wrapped up in a certain mentality. It's wrapped up in it. And it's constantly being reinforced. This materialism is constantly being reinforced. And it's not just being reinforced by some kafir media. It's being reinforced by Muslim cultures too that have been infected by these ideas. Your parents will tell you, yes, studying Quran is nice, but your real goal is to become a doctor. I have no problem with Desi kids becoming doctors and Arab kids becoming engineers. Let me qualify my statement, okay? 
I have no problem with you guys pursuing law and medicine. Go ahead, be the best doctor. Actually, own the hospitals. I encourage you. Own, don't just be, don't be a doctor at the hospital. Own the hospital. Be the best you can be. Fine. But you know, when the parents are pushing their children into these careers, they're not thinking, my son is going to save lives. My son is going to become a force of goodness in the world. Allah, Allah will use him to serve the deen better and better. What's the, what's, what's the thought in the mind? This. This is success. This is not success. This is not how Muslim thinks. But this is how we've started thinking. The reality is that is how we have started thinking. This is the mentality that has to be cut at its roots. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the beginning of the surah, and I'll take you to the beginning of the surah, I'm almost done. Alhamdulillah alladhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitab wa lam yaj'al lahu abdihi. All praise and gratitude belongs to Allah. That sent upon his slave the ultimate book, the final book, the kitab. وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ عِوَجًا He didn't leave any crookedness, any deviation, any room for criticism or attack in this book. The whole revolution against religion happened because they found crookedness in a book. And Allah says, I sent a book that has no crookedness. Now find, try to find it. So if the world has gone crooked, what's going to bring it back is the book of Allah. We have to become people that internalize the Book of Allah and are able to effectively communicate its ideas. Not only so we are, we are uh, healed by them, that we're able to heal others with them. That we're able to share with others the powerful ideas that this book contains. Qayyiman, it will stand upright. This book is not going anywhere. Philosophies in the world will come, rise and fall. Systems will rise and fall. Economies will rise and fall and we're seeing that today. Who could have said the European Union is going to go somewhere? 15 years ago, 10 years ago, who was going to say the European Union is done? Greek, for Greek, Greece, forget it. You know how desperate Turkey was to join the European Union? <laughs> how, they, how desperate they were? And now they're like, oh, actually, no thanks. <laughs> you, got, uh, you know what, can I, can I get back my, my application? <laughs> what are they going to do joining that sinking, sinking economy for? The world changes. But Allah says, this book, its teachings, its values, its principles, its solutions for humanity are upright. Qayyiman. It will stand upright. It will be in place. It will not move it from its place. Now I want to leave with one, one last ayah I want to leave you with. I don't want to uh, dwell too much on, on this part of it. I just wanted to highlight the timeless value of the Qur'an in this conversation. That's one. The timeless value of the Qur'an. At this point, maybe I'll take... What time is the time? Half an hour? I'll take 10 to 15 minutes, I promise. And I'll stick to it, inshallah. It was kind of like the, uh, kind of like Yusuf Salam with the prisoners. He told them, wait, by the time lunch gets here, I'll be done. Right? And when the lunch got here, he didn't say, wait, just five more minutes. And I conclude with, you ever heard those speeches? I do, I do those too. And my final point is, 35 minutes later, and in conclusion I say, <laughs> Right, so I'm giving you, I'm giving myself 15 minutes, 10 to 15 flat, 8:40, 9:40, inshallah. Okay, 8:40 would have been bad. That's tomorrow morning. Okay. So what I want to share with you now, inshallah, is our attitudes. We talked about our attitudes towards the world. What are Muslim attitudes towards the Quran? What are the common Muslim attitudes towards the Quran? The most common attitude Muslims hold across the world. Many Muslims are knowledgeable. Many of them are not. Knowledgeable. Many of them are people that come to the masjid. A huge number of them are people that don't even know where the masjid is. They live in San Antonio for 10 years. They don't know where the masjid is. They never seen one. They never been to one. But all of them share at least one idea about the Quran. The Quran is something special. It should be respected. At least that much. Even if you go to a Muslim family's home where they drink alcohol and they don't care about anything else, you'll still find a copy of the Quran up on the top shelf somewhere. And it's on the top shelf somewhere. Why? Because respect. You'll have weddings, wedding ceremonies. And of course, in wedding ceremonies, even if you're not religious, you still need to get exposed to some religious people because the Imam's going to come and perform the nikah. So at least one bearded guy is going to have to show up. You know? <laughs> so he shows up at the wedding. And when he shows up, because he's a prophet, and he's going to recite Quran, out of respect, maybe we'll put napkins on their head. Or, you know, find something, some paper bag, something like this. Because they, you know, just respect for Quran, even if they don't know what that means, somehow we have to respect this one. That much attitude is there. Then on top of that, there's another attitude, and the attitude is, this book has a lot of blessings in it. So even though I am really messed up, 
I'm really messed up. When I die, make sure you call a lot of people and they should all recite what? The Quran and through its blessings, um, all my messed up stuff will somehow disappear. So that's what we should do. Even whether you're religious or not doesn't matter, just make sure you enjoy the blessings of this Quran. Right? Just play some recitation of it in Ramadan or something at the home. And you'll be fine. Or there's a new one. Or the whole family's messed up, at least take one kid and make him a prophet. He's the guarantee for everybody else. He's the, he's the gatekeeper. He'll hold the door open. Hey, come on guys, it's okay. You guys get through. You know? So at least make one, make one kid happen in the family. That's a new one. That's our attitude towards the Quran. It's going to do its blessings. We will be saved. We don't have to change ourselves. We can be who we are, but you know, we'll just recite some Quran and all our problems will disappear. All our, all our troubles will be gone. Then there's another attitude that the Quran is awesome for special occasions or special problems. When you get really sick, guess what? Time to bust out the Mus'haf and start reciting. When you have a serious problem, time to start, time to start reciting the Quran. When you're about to get your daughter married, when you're about to, you know, or you bought, just bought a new house, at least have a Fatiha recited before you go into the house. Special occasions. This, this book is for special occasions. Every day, if you're reciting Quran every day, then you're a religious extremist. What happened to you? That's not why you come to Amrika. If you wanted to do that, you should have stayed back home. So you, you don't need the Qur'an, I mean, just, just call it for special occasions, that's it. You don't need it for anything else. Then on top of that, there's another interesting attitude. The Qur'an will protect you. <coughs> Qur'an will protect you. It will keep you from having a car accident. So take Ayatul Kursi, buy one from the store, and hang it in your rear view mirror. Right? That, because you don't have dual side airbags, you have an old car. So at least you have that. Right? Or uh, you're never going to recite that copy of the Qur'an, that Mus'haf, but you buy a Mus'haf and you put it in your dashboard. Why? I mean, come on, my brakes failed the last week, now I need to have some insurance policy. <laughs> so you have that. In so many parts of the Muslim world, they have cups with ayat of Qur'an inscribed on the inside. A drink from this and your sinus problem disappears, you know. Or they'll go, these the people will go and they'll put my out of Quran, make a patch out of them, put it around their arm, and now that it's here, now alhamdulillah, my motorcycle will never have a bad transmission. Because this, this is protecting me right here. This is what Quran has become to us. This is for most Muslims, that's what the Quran is. You ever seen, you know, some uh, in New York I saw a lot of times like Christian cab drivers or limo drivers and stuff, as a as a symbol, as a trinket, they'll put a crown in the back of their bag. All they'll, they'll, you know, they'll put a fish symbol on their car, symbol of Christianity. Or they'll hang a crucifix from the window. Their religion is reduced to trinkets. And when they get really scared, they hold their crucifix. They kiss it. You know? And what happens to the Muslim? I don't know. Is he holds his Allah chain. His Ayatul Kursi chain, his bulletproof vest, right? His Ayatul Kursi chain. That's what he holds. This, this is all Quran and stuff. It's a book to be respected, it's a book to be celebrated. So if anything, just listen, listen to some nice recitation of it, and then, you know, or just bless your ceremony with it and move on. You don't need it for anything else. You don't really need it for more than that. The Qur'an came to solve your problems and my problems. The Qur'an came to help you with the trouble you're having with your wife. The trouble you're having with your husband. The Qur'an came to help you to deal with your parents better, with your children better. The Qur'an came to help you get a decent job, to deal with your, to, to do your business things the right way. The Qur'an came to help you make your mornings right and make your evenings right. The Qur'an is the best advice you will ever get. It's mawa'iba, it's the best advice you will ever get. But you and I never thought of the Qur'an as advice. When you and I need advice, we go to a specialist, a counselor, Sometimes if you have serious issues, you go to a therapist. You know, you go to a psychologist, psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist lies you down and says, tell me about your problems. And you for an hour, you just sit there and you say, yeah, you know, I hate my sister, and my brother is evil, and my parents don't love me. And you just cry about it for an hour. And at the end of the hour, he says, so how does that make you feel? <laughs> and you say, I just told you how I felt. What do you mean? Oh well, time's up, that'll be $350. <laughs> That's therapy. You and I will be standing salat and we're reciting the Qur'an. We're not reciting the Qur'an. The Qur'an is reading us, it's therapy for us. We're supposed to be getting counsel from Allah directly and immediately. 
That's what the Quran is supposed to be. <coughs> this is what Allah has said. There's no crookedness in it. And when you experience that counsel of Quran for yourself, it has to be personally experienced. No lecture, no talk will help you experience that. You have to get that experience yourself for yourself. And the best time to experience that is in Salat itself. The way the Quran was meant to be experienced was in Salat. That's the real experience of the Quran. You come to understand certain ayat, you memorize those ayat, now you're standing in front of Allah and you recite those ayat, something happens inside you. Something changes. Something beautiful happens. Even salat for most of us has become cardiovascular exercise. It's become a speed contest. You put a timer. My uncle used to take me, one of my uncles used to take me to Taraweeh. And he used to take me to one masjid and he started taking me to another masjid for Taraweeh. You know, why are you, why are you going to a different much now? Because this one finishes 20 rakat in 38.5 minutes every day. That one takes 45 minutes. This is guy's faster. It's a speed contest now. You know, I don't have time for salat. I don't have time, so I'll pray. The quickest salat I'll pray is the asr prayer. The asr, like one asr. <laughs> the one that's supposed to make you respect your time for Allah. We don't give that prayer any time. <laughs> the irony of it all. So the point I'm trying to make before all of you is that an intellectual decline is happening, a spiritual decline is happening, and the solution to both of those declines is us seriously going back and redeveloping a relationship with the Quran. I want to share something personal with you in seven minutes. I have seven minutes done. I'm still keeping my time. When I first read the Quran in translation, it was high school. Late high school, I read the Quran in translation. I read the Yusuf Ali translation, may Allah reward him. I tried to read it, I got through about 200 ayat of Baqarah and I quit. Couldn't take it anymore. Couldn't do it. The English was so hard. It was so Shakespearean. And on, even if you do get the English, there was way too much going on. I thought I was reading about a battle, then all of a sudden Hajj came up, and fasting, and what's going on here? Why are all these subjects like, why isn't there like a chapter on Hajj and I can just read about Hajj? Why isn't there just a chapter on the battle and I can read about the battle? Everything's jumbled together. I don't get it. I gave up on it. I gave up on it. That next Ramadan is the first time I actually heard the Qur'an being explained in simple language. Just like somebody's talking to me. My teacher, Dr. Abdul Samiya, was doing a dars of the Qur'an in Urdu, but basically as a Qur'an is a conversation. This is the first time in my life, I've been Muslim my whole life, but that was the first time in my life something hit me that had never hit me before. Allah is actually talking to me. Allah is actually giving me personal advice. This is a conversation between master and slave. He spoke to his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and threw him to all believers. We're supposed to, you know, many of you know this, but we're reciting Surah al theme. أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِأَحْكَمِ الْحَاكِمِينَ What are we supposed to do? Bala. Bala. Why not? Of course. Allah says something, we say something. What is that called? When somebody says something, somebody says something else. It's a conversation. Exactly, it's a conversation. The Quran itself is a conversation between me and Allah. I thought of it as a book before then. Just like any other book. Since that day, I started thinking of it as like, like literally Allah is talking to me. He's giving me advice, He's giving me counsel. And when you come to the Quran with that attitude, you will discover advice, you will discover wisdom for your own life that you never thought possible. And, you, and I, when I started discovering, I'm hearing my teacher talk, and I, there's like 200 people sitting in the audience, right? And I'm thinking, he's just talking to me. That's what it felt like, he's just talking, he's not talking to anybody else. He's like, how, how does Allah know that? And then he goes through the ayah, He doesn't know who he created. Doesn't he know what he, who he created? SubhanAllah, he knows. He knows who he's talking to. This becomes a relevant, direct, immediate conversation between us and Allah. And that's the first step in us fixing ourselves as an Ummah to once again engage Allah in the perfect conversation. To become connected with this Quran again, especially in our salawat, especially in our prayers. This needs to happen. The month of Ramadan is around the corner, is it not? You and I have to start gearing up. We have to start making time for the Qur'an every day. We have to start getting ready from now. I don't know if I'm going to see this Ramadan or not. You don't know either. We don't know if Allah will take us before that. But if we have the intention, we have the intention, this Ramadan will be the one where 
and I will experience the Qur'an as Allah wants me to experience it. I will come closer to Allah's book, and by coming close to Allah's book, I will get close to Him. I will understand better what He wants from me. The Qur'an is not just a book of halal and haram. It's not just a book of Jahannam and Naal, Jahannam and Jannah. It's not. The Qur'an is a book of beautiful things. Even the way He talks about halal and haram is so beautiful. No, no book of fiqh. No scholar, no imam is going to explain to you or give you the beauty with which Allah says it. When Allah says it, it just has a different effect. This has a completely different effect. So my, my personal experience, when I first discovered the Qur'an as a conversation, my attitude towards the Qur'an entirely changed. And that was maybe 12 years ago, that that happened for me. And those these last 12 years, if I've had something to study that I say I really want to study, it's been the Qur'an, for that reason. And I still continue, I'm still very much a beginner student of the Qur'an, I, I'm very much. <coughs> but the more I study the Qur'an, the more I realize, man, this is what I was looking for. It's like, the, sometimes I read it in eyes, it's like, this is the first time I came across this, subhanAllah. This problem I had just got solved. This counsel I needed just, it was just given to me. It's just immediate, relevant, possible, perfect advice. Perfect, perfect advice. So this is the, inshallah ta'ala, the attitude with which I want all of us, maybe not to make the intention, that we're going to really make the month of Ramadan, the month of the Quran. And we're going to gear up for that from now. I'll give you some practical advice in the three minutes I have left. How can you do that? How do you gear up to get like really close to the Qur'an as much as humanly possible? Number one, if there are halaqat of the Qur'an happening at the masjid, if there's a tafsir halaqa happening, if there's any study circle happening at the masjid, come to it. Doesn't matter who's presenting it, just come. Come and attend. At least from now, make the time. Come and attend. If you cannot come and attend, find whatever tafsir videos or resources you can find online and start watching. Notice I didn't say read translation first. I didn't say that. You know why? Because I can't recommend that experience. I tried that myself. <laughs> That's the one that left me confused. Right? So I can only imagine when you're reading translation of the Quran, you will probably get more questions than answers. If you are going to read something, buy a tafsir and read it. I recommend <coughs> in English very little is available. Pondering over the Quran is available in English. I recommend that. Uh, Mufti Muhammad Shafi is Ma'arif of Quran is translated into English. I recommend that. It's good reading. It's good simple reading and it's a, it's a good concise tafsir it gives you fruits of the ayat and things like that. If you really don't have any time whatsoever, if you just want to read a translation of the Quran, I recommend the Abdul Halim translation by Oxford University Press. It's, it's good powerful translation. I, I don't agree with it hundred percent, but nonetheless it's a good flowing translation and it's not hard on you. You're not going to find words like past thou not seenest and be confused like what is this talking about? It's not going to be Shakespearean language, you know? But get involved, start reading. Start for, this, this is for your understanding. But a real relationship with the Qur'an does not happen until you and I are trying to memorize. Start memorizing the Qur'an people. Pray Fajr, 15 minutes, just one eye. You don't have to memorize a page. You don't have to do a lot, just one eye. Just do a little bit, but start. Don't be lazy about it. Don't overdo it. If you try to do too much, you'll give up. You'll do it one day for two hours and pat yourself on the back and the next day you're like, I don't have two hours anymore. Do short, what you can handle. What, what, you, what you can do, 10, 15 minutes. Memorize a little bit of the Qur'an every day. A thousand miles begin with a step. Right, so just take little, little steps and inshallah ta'ala through that your salat will start becoming more and more and more beautiful. You'll start experiencing a, a, more of a joy in your salawat. I wanted to, as I close, I wanted to make a quick announcement. And that is, so I am exactly on time, inshallah. The announcement I wanted to make is that uh, at Bayina, which has been in Dallas for a long time, I hope to bring some programs here uh, to San Antonio. It's been, it's, it's been on my radar for some time, but my schedule simply hasn't allowed it because of campus obligations and family obligations. I, 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 I'm pretty sure you guys can understand that. But I do hope to make a trip here as soon as possible. Uh, almost immediately after Ramadan, I think I'll try and make a trip here. Allah <laughs> So, but before that, I have a serious request for you. The reason I, I came here for this trip today, and I dragged some students here with me, is to actually invite you guys to come to Dallas for a day. I wanted as many of you as possible to come to our conference. But you guys putting its first conference together, and the point of, the, the title of the conference is Amazed by the Qur'an. That's what the conference is called. And it's actually at amazedbythequr'an.com. That's what the website for the conference is. Myself, 
Sheikh Abdul Nasser Janga, and Imam Sahib Webb are the three presenters at the conference. It's a one-day program, it's a short program, and it's meant for the entire family. The, the, the whole agenda for the program, the whole point of putting that conference together is to get a whole lot of Muslims together and study a little bit of the Qur'an and refresh in ourselves why are we so amazed by this book. What's so awesome about this book? The point is not education. The point is appreciation. The education is easy. Appreciation is hard. Our children, you can teach them something, but it's very hard to have them appreciate it. Your child can memorize this surah, but he won't appreciate what's the point of memorizing this surah? Why is this surah so awesome anyway? I don't get it. The point of the program is to encourage Muslims or to help Muslims appreciate the power of the Qur'an, the beauty of the Qur'an. Each of us are going to have two sessions each, myself, Shaykh Abdul Nasir, Imam Sahib Web. So I'm really excited to have this opportunity to come and speak to you and try and invite you to the program. I'm going to ask that you guys uh, help me pass these out as I'm speaking before you. And my time is up past the announcement, so whatever questions you may have at this point, you're welcome to ask. And I hope you guys benefit it, inshallah ta'ala. And I also hope to see you guys very, very soon. This is on June the 30th, by the way. So if you can mark your calendars, this is Saturday, June the 30th. And I hope that you guys with your families can come and make it and sign up early so that the seats aren't filled ahead of time. It's uh, amazed by the Quran.com. Jazakumullah khairan wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If there are any questions, I'll take them down.